So hello everybody, welcome to today's uh, edition of uh, CESI Talks. CESI Talks is an interview series, part of the WEEP project, a project uh, financed also by the European Parliament in order to raise awareness uh, of the importance of the EU and not only to see which negative sides or which deficiencies the EU has, but also to put uh, the flesh on the advantages. And um, it's particularly now in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, I mean, we noticed that so many citizens are actually in favor of more EU. And the question here will be also, has the EU delivered? Has the EU failed? And which, what should be improved? And today, I'm very pleased to welcome MEP Radan Kanev. He's member of the EPP group from Bulgaria, for us, a very important member of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, and also in these COVID-19 times, very important, he's substitute member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. Mr. Kanev, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind presentation. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kanev, as, as I as I just said, the 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 EU is often referred to as having contributed to undermine social rights. Can you maybe give concrete examples of the past years, so also pre-COVID, which actually show the opposite, which was the role of the European Parliament? Yes. First, first of all, uh, I would like to to point out my opinion that uh, COVID crisis didn't show us anything new, in fact, on the labor market. What, uh, what the crisis did was to uh, really very strongly accelerate trends that we already knew quite well and that we already felt. And then uh, some uh, forecasts we had on the labor market just came into reality very, very fast. We were preparing for all these changes. We were discussing all these changes. Uh, we were making plans uh, how to tackle challenges uh, in uh, like say uh, three, four or 10 years. And then suddenly uh, all these problems and all these challenges uh, are nowadays reality. Uh, we are facing them today. Uh, be it uh, the, the really precarious conditions of many, especially mobile workers in the European Union, uh, be it the, uh, the remote work uh, trend with all, uh, all its challenges, uh, be it uh, the platform work or the delivery based uh, on location services, uh, just uh, facing such a tremendous growth within a few months. But they had a huge growth the decade before as well, and especially the last three years. So once again, it's uh, not something new. Um, is it for you an advantage to be a worker in the European Union or would it rather be a disadvantage? And of course, which would be the reason for which? Oh, in, uh, uh, in such situation, of course, uh, you only have to compare. Uh, there is no uh, absolute advantage being a worker or absolute disadvantage. Uh, me uh, having the, uh, the benefit, let's say, uh, when we speak about comparisons like this, uh, of uh, being a worker outside the European Union for many years in my life, uh, I can easily say, yes, it's better to work in the European Union, even in times of crisis, in, even in times when the, the European Union is not uh, doing perfectly. Uh, when you compare to other European countries or to neighboring countries in the Middle East or North Africa, uh, there is an advantage. And I don't think uh, countries like Norway or Switzerland are uh, a decent comparison because uh, they have uh, really specific traditions and history. And furthermore, they are more or less part of the European labor market and uh, their economies cannot exist without the partnership with Europe as it is. Uh, so, yes, it is an advantage to be, a, to be a worker in Europe. And one of the significant advantages is that uh, Europe is utterly democratic. Uh, so the, the voice of people is uh, really heard on political level, be it on national or, or European level. And uh, now the, the last uh, years, but especially the last months, due to this COVID acceleration of, uh, of problems, the social issues are very, very high on the political agenda. We see that there is no uh, classical liberal right anymore in Europe. 
I've been in the in the classical liberal right in Bulgaria. I've been in in the parties that say uh, we don't need to to care about workers. Market will do it. But but now there is no such a political trend at all. Social issues are high on the agenda. You said if we speak of the recovery plan, how can we make sure? How did the parliament or how is the t- parliament trying to make sure that? Um, b- workers will benefit and to which aspects of this recovery plan or the resilience and recovery uh, programs um, from the member states do we have to pay attention to? Of course, the, the parliament is uh, uh, discussing almost exclusively about, uh, about jobs, about labor and about quality jobs lately. Uh, I had two interventions only this morning uh, in the plenary. One was uh, on the employment aspects of the European semester and the next one on the action plan for the European pillar of social rights. So it's uh, the whole uh, March plenary of the parliament is more or less focused on, on social issues. And it will be the same for many uh, plenary sittings to come. Of course, we, we have to bear in mind the, uh, the powers of the European Parliament or the European institutions as a whole uh, are not uh, that strong, in fact. And uh, uh, what we see in this debate is a bit more of a recommendation for the member states to enhance their social protection levels or to to do more about uh, uh, much needed new regulations. And what I would say, because uh, as I said, uh, I was uh, a die-hard market liberal uh, in my uh, in my uh, younger years, and I'm very much pro-market uh, now. What I uh, what I would say is, uh, it is of utter importance to find the public finances to to finance, promote, invest in the adaptation of the European labor market as a whole, the single market and the national labor systems uh, to changes that we cannot stop even if we want to. That was the the main point of of my just recent uh, intervention in the plenary. Uh, If we uh, study carefully uh, the incentives of both workers, employers and customers, uh, we can see that Uh, the trend to platform-based labor market, technology-based labor market, remote office and uh, and home uh, work-based labor market. This is a trend that we cannot stop. We see the risks. Uh, We see many of these risks already rising into actual problems. Uh, We have to tackle the risks, we have to tackle the problems, but we cannot tackle the technological trend. Furthermore, we cannot simply forcefully impose our old labor regulations on new realities. What we need to do is to adapt regulations, but already find the financial means to to help companies adapt their technology based uh, uh, work to the new realities. And one thing, but uh, last, really not least, to to adapt our uh, public financial systems. Because when we have people working for a few hours on many places within a month and at the end of the month, uh, they they sometimes haven't matched even one threshold to be on the social security system, to be under social or health coverage, to have any retirement plan. This is obviously a huge risk for themselves, but for our solidarity pension systems as well. So we need to find the technological means, and it is administrative work. It's work for the government uh, to to get all this information, to have a strong personal record, to have, I would say, every working minute counted for the social benefits of every worker. Never mind whether he's providing his his platform-based work in uh, Sweden or in Bulgaria, uh, whether he's working for one, two, or three different companies for 200 or only one customer. Uh, We need to have have the record of this person, to have his social benefits duly paid either by himself as self-employed or by the employer, if it's an employer uh, employment relation, as most of this work 
in fact is we see the the court verdicts in this direction so to have people working uh, in the in the modern world under modern technologies uh, covered in the good old way by social benefits um you mentioned also the the pillar and um the action plan for the implementation of the social pillar what is i mean you 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 responded already um, partially to this question but what are for you the key elements of this pillar to make how could i say despite the very difficult situation we're in employment and quality employment feasible in the coming years i would say that the, the european pillar of social rights says nothing new but uh, maybe says something uh, something really forgotten and this is the general idea of social market economy the uh, the Wohlstand für alle idea the welfare for uh, for everyone uh, because uh, the last uh, 30 years i would uh, i would say we also the the inequalities uh, rising uh, we also this uh, basic idea of the 70s and 80s that almost everybody is middle class in in Europe but also in North America for a for a longer period disappearing uh, we saw the the classical notion of, uh, of middle class meddling uh, uh, and watering down for many years and uh, now what we're trying to do is to rebuild the European social model in uh, a new uh, a new technology world uh, it was built for for the industrial world of the 20th century now we need to rebuild it for the post-industrial world of the 21st century that's what the pillar is is all about it's not uh, i have uh, friends uh, colleagues in the epp who are a bit afraid of the high stakes of uh, of the pillar being themselves more uh, small medium enterprises based market based and, and so on but in fact the the pillar is not that ambitious at all we don't have to be afraid uh, we have to be realistic and to uh, to accept the goals and to keep in mind that we have no certainty whatsoever about the means to achieve it um it's a kind of uh, maybe as a closing question because um, you took the floor recently concerning also um, uh, in relation to the EU COVID-19 vaccination strategy. I mean, we are at the moment also in a situation where we hear strong criticism being addressed to to the European Union, where certain people say, I mean, you know, the debate that, um, for instance, to be outside of the European Union would have made things easier. but. We also know that, uh, and this is, I think, particularly interesting. You, you, you also your Bulgarian citizenship to have that from that angle. Also to say, what you, what do you say relating to the strategy? Was it a success? Is it a success? And where would certain countries, maybe like Bulgaria, be without it? Uh, to to judge the European vaccine strategy, uh, we have to judge at least three different decisions. One was the common procurement of vaccines. Uh, another one was the long bargaining over the price. And the third one was the decision uh, not to give uh, emergency authorizations. Uh, so the, the combination of the three ones uh, led us to a significant delay, uh, comparing in fact only to the, to the UK and to the US. Because as, as we see, uh, Asia, China, uh, Russia, India are lagging far behind even uh, even Europe in vaccination. Uh, so uh, about the, the, the common procurement, uh, I would definitely say it was not not a mistake because yes, maybe maybe if uh, uh, there was a single country procurement process, Denmark would be uh, much better than now and the Netherlands as well. Uh, maybe maybe even Germany being 80 millions. But yet uh, everybody in, in Netherlands, in Denmark, in Germany knows that uh, to have this uh, robust economy, they need the European Union. They need the open borders. They need the, the free trade within the Union. They need us to be uh, a, a free movement space. So uh, if 
if uh, Italy uh, is lagging behind with vaccination, if Bulgaria is, if Romania is, if Spain is, then you still have the same problem. Uh, and you still cannot uh, go on with recovering uh, your economy. Uh, so uh, common procurement was, uh, was a good deal for Europe. And uh, even for those uh, more advanced countries that are considering it uh, maybe as a mistake now. When it comes to the price bargaining, maybe this was the, the big mistake. Because I would, uh, I would say that emergency authorization would be a problem in Europe. We see there is uh, uh, much misinformation and disinformation about vaccines. And if you could add the argument that there is an emergency authorization, not enough trials, not enough uh, information to this propaganda, then maybe we would face even, even deeper problem with the motivation with uh, people to, to vaccinate. And maybe if there was a mistake, it was this uh, very harsh price bargaining that we know very little about, but uh, obviously happened and delayed the contracts with the main producers. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I, uh, I say it again, US and the UK, they made emergency authorization. Uh, they paid the first price offered and uh, they have full exclusivity on the vaccines produced on their territory. They don't export uh, any single job. In, uh, in this situation, it is obvious that uh, they will lead the race if it's a, if it's a race. And then after, after them, Europe is, is doing well. But uh, obviously the producers don't have the initially foreseen capacity and all the process will take more time than we hoped and expected. But uh, let's, let's hope on the effectiveness of vaccines for the, uh, for the new versions of, of the virus. If that's the case, then still uh, we'll be uh, with the problem behind us at the end of this year. It's, uh, it's something. Mr. Kanev, uh, his final word, maybe in direction of trade unions, are they needed in these moments? Are they particularly needed? What is your opinion? I think the, the trade unions, the social dialogue, the social bargaining are the uh, only, uh, and if not only, the very main solution to the problem that I uh, tried to explain with my first answer. The solution to, to have a tailor-made uh, social security uh, solutions uh, for, the new, uh, for the new technology challenges on the labor market. Uh, I'm sure that uh, governments themselves or the European institutions cannot find the answer alone. So we need to find it together on a social dialogue basis. And uh, this is the crucial role of, uh, of the trade unions in Europe at the moment. Mr. Kanev, thank you very much. All the best to you. Um, good work in the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.